We are in a, we're in a series of James, and we have inched our way through this, and today is no different. We're in James chapter 2, verse 14, and uh, we're, we're, we're just put, peeling this onion apart, and I, I hope you're getting something from it, because there's so many things that James touches on. It's going to touch every part of our life, and many people ask, how do you study the Bible, George? And well, I'm showing you how I studied. I study it piece by piece. And so hopefully I can get it in a language. My, my job is not to make things deeper, it's to take the deep and make it simple. And so hopefully we're, we're doing that here. So actually, I started this a couple weeks ago, and we're going to finish it today. James chapter 2, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed, watch where he goes with this. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one, one of you says, go in peace, be warm and feel without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that, right? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled saying that Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. We'll talk about this in a second. And he was a friend of he was called a friend of God. You see a person that's justified by faith, by works and not by faith alone. We're going we're to chew on this in a minute. So. And in the same way, James is brilliant. In the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also, so also faith apart from works is dead. Whew. A lot of reading. Now, I'm going to go back to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 because it almost sounds like James is contradicting Paul, all right? And there's a big, there's a big debate out there. Were they in a fight? Were they, you know, at odds and uh, that? And, and, you know, I don't know that, but the Scripture has to line up with each other, right? It can't, it can't contradict. And so, it's not co contradicting here, but here's, here's what Paul says in Ephesians 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. So it almost like, sounds like James saying you got to have works to, you know, not just faith, it's works or you can't be saved. Um, it's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. How many like gifts? Brandon said, how many like free stuff? If you go to the VIP room, VIP, I call it the VIP because it's VIP and I ask them what VIP means and it always throws them off. But if you go there today, you're going to get something free and nobody's going to tell you, by the way, here's a gift, you owe us five bucks. All right, it's a gift of God, salvation is. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. Watch this, verse 10. I'm going to tell you how in line they are with each other. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. They're saying the same thing. Paul is saying, Paul is saying, this is how you get saved in Ephesians, Galatians. Paul is writing these things. This is how you get saved. James is saying, this is what salvation looks like after you get saved, right? Uh, but Paul is also saying what James is saying. When you get saved, it should produce, hello, it should produce something in you that should lead to good works that God has prepared beforehand for us to do. We are his workmanship. We are his craftsmanship. I look at him and say he's got a sense of humor. I look in the mirror this morning and I went, God, you're funny. <laughs> I ain't as good as I once was. I don't even know if I'm good once as I ever was. So Paul is dealing with being saved by grace, not by works. James is dealing with when you have been saved by grace, it should show up in works 
of mercy toward others. He deals with this. James does. Paul is saying you're, you're saved by grace, not by works. Through faith, you have been saved so that no man should boast. Why does he put that there? It doesn't happen here, not, not in this church, but other churches I've heard it happens. But James is saying you can't boast and show mercy at the same time. You can't take credit for your salvation and show mercy to somebody else for the same time you know the same thing in other words I work for what I got you go work for what you got right I had to work for it I'm not giving it to you because if I had to work for it my givers kind of broke but if I understand mercy and understand that what he gave me he, he didn't give me what I deserve thank God instead he gave me what I didn't deserve which is salvation that's grace you can't, you can't boast about your salvation and say, that's why, that's why Paul wrote that, so that no man can boast. It's not by your works at all, because if you think you've got something to do with it, you're going to look at somebody else, and there's going to be superiority, and there's going to be conflict in the church like there was. So what happens is, if you feel this, you will put the same merciless stipulations and expectations on others. And you say to the poor, get a job. I mean, that's not bad advice. I still believe sweat won't kill you. I mean, I sweated this weekend. I'm replacing a fence that a drunk drove through my fence this week. Right? And he left. He didn't leave me a $10 and say, here, this will buy a nail. Uh, instead, I had the, the, the highway patrolman come knocking on my door at 10 o'clock while I'm watching Gunsmoke. <laughs> me and my dog, Bubba, it's our nightly routine watching gun smoke Matt's about to shoot somebody and I see two highway patrolmen coming up my sidewalk here and at 10 o'clock at night when you got two highway patrolmen that's never good news and I'm thinking where's my daughters what's going on and I'm thinking bad news and they go hey Bob somebody run through your fence and da 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 and so I've been out there sweating it doesn't kill you so you know I, I know people that wouldn't read the book of Job they saw it they thought it meant job Anyway, I won't go down that, but it's not what James is dealing with here. We'll talk about this later. He's going to explain, okay, because we've got to put it in context of where they're at. Uh, verse 15, let's read this. For brother or sister, here, there's a key here. James is writing to the church. He's talking about a brother or a sister. This is not talking about your sibling, right? It's not talking about Fred and Martha. It's talking about your brother or sister in the church in Christ. It was their responsibility to take care of each other. What a novel idea. What a novel idea for brothers, sisters in need, whether that be whatever that we as the church helped. Starting here, right? We do a great job on Wednesdays. We, I don't know how many backpacks we have put out. I don't know how many bags of food. I think it's like 21,000 bags of food in a year we, we put out on, the, on Wednesdays. We do, right, right. And I'm for that. James isn't writing about community outreach. He's talking about, he's, he's, he's talking about community inreach. If your brother or sister comes to you, watch this. Uh, and they lack food. They lack clothing. Uh, daily food. Not, not, they're not putting up for the apocalypse. They don't have daily food. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? James, is, he's using this illustration. How many of you ate a donut this morning? It's not a sin to eat a donut. How many of you got donuts? It's incredible. Uh, he uses a simple illustration. A poor believer comes into the church without good clothing or food. And James uses two basic needs. Uh, he didn't go into, I need a new car. You know, mine doesn't have Bluetooth. Uh, he says they don't have food and clothing, two basic needs. The person who has dead faith, this is how you'll know what dead faith looks like. This is, this is how you'll know what a person, this is what a person looks like who doesn't understand what mercy gave him, what grace gave him. If you truly understand what Jesus did for us that we couldn't do for ourselves and the debt that we owed, if you understood truly the debt, it was, we couldn't pay it. When you, if you always keep that at the forefront of your mind, okay? 
Obviously, they were, these were people who could not take care of themselves. They were not lazy. James wasn't dealing with laziness. That's, that's in Proverbs. Okay? He's dealing with people who really couldn't take care of themselves. He'll explain why in a couple weeks. Dead faith, here's, here's dead faith. Dead faith notices the need, notices the person, has the ability, listen, has the ability, not just daily food. This person has more than daily food. This person that, that, that he is using has an abundance, has shelves full, and we'll talk about this, but he's got enough. All right, he's got extra clothing with tags on it. When he goes to Walmart, he buys three pairs of jeans because he likes the way they look. He's got them stacked up still. And this person comes and knocks and says, I'm hungry, and, and we, look, I want to come to church, but it's not that, you know, it's the thing I hear all the time, I don't have anything to wear. People tell me that all the time, and I look at them and go, wear that. You know, so glad we're over that hurdle. These, these people have nothing. Their clothes is, is maybe, maybe revealing things that people don't need to see. The person with dead faith knows the situation, can do something about it, yet does nothing to help this brother or sister. Instead, they offer words instead of actions. And this is the typical Christian knees, Christian escape. This is your exit and your scapegoat and whatever else you want to call it. Brother, we're going to pray for you. Go, be blessed. You can get charismatic with it. Everybody stretch your hand. Go, be blessed and warmed. Be filled with what? A person with dead faith, you would say, well, I prayed for it. That should be faith. No, that's, that's, that's escapism. You out there today? Jesus said, and we're smart. I mean, you're here at first service, you're smart. Jesus said, or James said, what, what did that profit him? Nada. He came hungry, he left hungry. He came with holes all in his clothes. He left with clothes. All you said is, I'm going to pray for you. And 99.9% of the time, you don't even do that. <laughs> Guilty. You know what I've started doing? If I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, I pray right then. <laughs> but here's why. Hey, hey, hey. Here's why. Because I ain't that spiritual. My phone will ring. I'll get salt and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll forget about that. You know why? Because it's not me needing bread. Right? So I've learned right then, if I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, I either pray for them personally or I pray right then. Why? Because I forget. I'm that human. Even so, that kind of faith, what kind of faith? A faith that understands, a faith that sees a need, a faith that forgets what Jesus done, that I was destitute, I was hopeless, I was helpless, but God, through, through his grace, sent Jesus to die on my... James has got to keep it in perspective, and so do we in the church, brothers and sisters. We're not at the drive-thru on Wednesdays right now for the community. We're talking about church community. That's what he's talking about. Even so, that kind of faith, if it does not produce, uh-oh, what is in me will produce outwardly. Something. If it does not produce works, in this case, meeting a need, it's dead, it's lifeless, it's useless, it's workless faith. Workless faith is worthless faith. You need to write that down. That, that's, that was good. That was a good squirrel. That was a good squirrel. That was like, a I got a black squirrel that comes to my house and he's so cool. You don't see him much. That was a black squirrel. Workless faith is worthless faith. Verse 18. You okay out there? But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. 
You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Uh oh. I will show you my faith. I will show you my faith by my works. That is the basis of all of this. That is the basis of all of this. I will show you my faith. You want to know if I'm a man of faith? Watch me. You want to know if I understand what Jesus did on the cross and that he paid for my debt and I truly get that? Watch me. Oh, hello. Deep seats, you up there? I can't see you, but I feel you. That's the basis of all of this. I will show you my faith by my works. He does not say, I will work and God will accept me and save me. No, he says, the faith that I have causes action in me because God already accepts me. I'm not trying to work for what I've got. I've already gotten because of what I've got. That's the reason why I do. I'm not working for it. I'm working because of it. And I want to show others what he has shown me. Mercy. Now he throws us a curveball and he uses demons. Oh, James, 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 James. You talk about a squirrel chaser. James. He uses demons. You start talking about demons, people pay attention, right? Uh, there's school teachers who just went back to school, and you probably said, Dear God, over the summer, they contracted a demon. And parents are going, Have that demon. The demons believe in God. Think about this. The demons believe in God. And you say you believe in God. So he, he's, he's paralleling. Hey, you believe in God? I tell people all the time, I believe in God. Preacher, I believe in God. Incredible. So do the demons. That's kind of harsh, isn't it? Like to compare your belief with a demon. That's what he did. And he's driving this point home. The demons do and they shudder, they tremble. But what sets us apart from them? Obvious, obviously, it's not belief in God. Now, notice he does use belief in God, not faith in Jesus. I must have stayed up last night. Belief and trust are not the same thing, belief and faith are not the same thing. The demons believe in the existence of God, but their faith is not evidenced by works motivated by faith. But what James is trying to drive home is true faith in Christ, saving faith, involves more than believing in God. It produces in us and ultimately outside of us something that can be seen in our actions. It will change our lives. Listen, because when we truly put our faith in Christ, right? The Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. Thank God for those of you when Brandon was talking about leading the life group, right? You said, I can't do this. Well, David couldn't kill Goliath. He wanted to, and you people say, well, I want to lead a life group. When you, some of you, I don't know what a life group is. It's like 12 people and couples meet in a home, and, and they do things in curriculum, and it's a cool thing, and they community, and the Word. And People say, I want to do it, but I don't know that I can. Listen, listen to me. Peter couldn't walk on water. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. Listen, listen. Some of you need to step out in faith and watch the Holy Spirit do something through you that will blow your mind. But you'll never know setting your hineys on the sideline. Right? That, that's free. Now, that was a squirrel. That was a big, ugly squirrel. I got to get off the squirrel thing, but they made a shirt about it. And if you're, not, and you're new here, you don't know, ask somebody. It's really crazy. Uh, when we truly put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence. And his job, listen to me, his job, his role is to help us be like Jesus. Because I can't be like Jesus. With the Holy Spirit, he, 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 he's like, oh. I think that's what the Holy Spirit in me does. God, oh, George, what? We've been through this. But he don't give up. That's why James says, I will show you by faith by what I do. When I put my faith in Christ, I receive life, then I reveal life. I receive life, then I reveal life. I receive grace, I reveal grace. I received mercy, I reveal mercy. Hey, and he's not even talking about in Africa. He's talking about right here in your local assembly. Right, we get way too far out. 
oh, we got to reach the world. We hadn't reached, we hadn't reached Orange County. I'm all about the world. We have missionaries that are called to do that. We support them. I, I guarantee you when you leave here today, you'll probably be surrounded if you go anywhere by hundreds of people who need to be reached. All right. The demon had intellectual faith. They believe. They had emotional faith. They trembled. They shuddered. But neither of those will lead to life change. That's why we don't uh, manipulate people's emotions around here. We could probably do that, make you feel gross and dirty and ooh, cry. You can leave here cry and say, I just, God just moved. No, I, I'm, in, I'm manipulating. I'm not saying that God don't move on you and cry. That, that happens, right? But we don't ma manipulate people's emotions around here, right? We don't try to manipulate your intellectual emotion. No, none of that. That don't work. That don't work. Try to scare somebody of Jesus. I call it scaring the hell out of people. To keep them out of hell. No, 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 no. Listen to me. If the cross of Christ isn't good enough, I can't come up with anything. If what Jesus, listen, listen to me. I had to tell a man the other day, he was trying to do all kinds of stuff to get this guy saved and looking. I said, look, man, I don't care what you do, you can't top. A man going, I'm all willing to let you hang me on the cross and bleed out for somebody's sins. If, if that don't work, nothing will. That's actually good news. All right. It's true faith that understands what Jesus did that causes me, that causes me to want to serve him, want to fulfill his mission on earth. And I want to tell you the demons don't do that. Verse 21, we're moving along. Ooh, I've got to hurry. It was not Abraham. I'm going to have to spend some time here. This is going to, this is going to eat me up here. It was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? How many of you right there would say, aha, uh -huh. Paul and James are on two different roads. Was not our father, Abraham, our father, justified when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? And the scripture says, fulfilling Abraham, believed God, it was counted him righteousness. He's called a friend of God. I'd like to be called that one day. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers, sent them out another way. For uh, as the body apart from the spirit is dead, also faith apart from works is dead. All right, let's break this down. We've got 11 minutes, 14 seconds, 13 seconds, 12 seconds. <laughs> Abraham, the patriarch, and Rahab, the redeemed prostitute. What is James doing here? What's he up to? Why these two people? They are total opposites of each other. The patriarch and the prostitute. What did they have in common? Both exercised saving faith in God in the Old Testament. Genesis 15, 6 says this, Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. All right, I'll explain this. This Abraham did before there was ever the law, there was ever, you know, the Ten Commandments. There was, he did this way before any of that stuff. Abraham was before all of that. Isaac, his son, was not even born yet. His son was not even taken to, if you know the story, God said, take your only son, and I'm not going to get into it, but I really need to get into all of it because, so people will understand that they waited so long for a kid, and he was 100, she was in her 90s, and got pregnant. I mean, the story is she took it in her own hands, went out and got one of her handmaidens that looked good, looked like a fiddly, and brought her in, said, I think that would make a good-looking kid, and brought it into her husband, uh, said, no woman. Said, no wife, here's my handmaid, have her. Said, no woman. Right? They have a kid, blah, blah, blah. It's out of God's will. It's, that's the Arabs today. It's a big mess, right? Right? How I many of you, you know, we're going over there trying to get their oil right now, and they're going, no problem. We'll just jack it up. It's Arabs. That came out of this. But anyway, God promised them a kid after that. And 
they have this kid. His name's Isaac. It's in their old age. You know, Abraham knows how to tease. You know what I mean? He's got Metamucil by the bed and just that takes a shot in the morning and the evening. And you know all that stuff. It smells like mentholatum in the house. It's just, it's, it's, there's just no way this is going to work. You know what I mean? It's kind of like people, I want, to, I want a kid. I want to lead a life good I can't. And God goes, just let me take care of that end. And they get pregnant and have this kid, Isaac, their only child, and they're so excited. And God says, here's what I want you to do, Abraham. I want you to take him and sacrifice him. I say, what? And without hesitation, Abraham the next morning loads up the donkey, the wood, the son, the servant. Right? You remember the story? And they're walking up the hill. And Isaac's now... Isaac's now about 13 or 14. He's not a little kid. He can probably o- overtake the old man. If any of you guys remember the day you pinned your dad, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, pull that belt out one more time, old man. <laughs> I'll wrap it around you like nothing. You, you remember that when you, right? Anyway, he's walking up the hill. Isaac, Abraham. Isaac does not know what God told Abraham that, hey, take him up there and kill him. I know that's tempting at times, right? 13, 14 year olds. You know, they didn't have Snapchat and social media then, but anyway. And, and Isaac looks at his dad and he goes, Hey, dad, I see the wood, I see the fire. Where, where's the sacrifice? Because Abraham tells him, We're going up here to sacrifice. Watch this. Watch this. The Lord will provide the sacrifice. Sound like a man who's already got faith. Hello. This happens in Genesis 15, right? When God says he believed in the Lord and has counted to him as righteousness. God put righteousness in Abraham's account, okay? Um, Abraham did not work for his righteousness. He received, he received it as a gift from God. Please, please hang on with me. If I don't finish it this week, I'll finish this next week. But I'm not going to rush through this. Abraham believed the Lord. This is Old Testament. He was counted in him as righteous. God, that, that word counted is a, is a financial term. God, God put some credit in his account. How many of you like it when you, when you get a check and, and, and the, the insurance overpaid you, which happens never, but it's hypothetical? Right? Too much in here account, right? And in other words, he, 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 he counted him as righteousness because he believed God's word. He had faith in God. And Abraham did not work for it. It was just a gift. Now, that's Genesis 15, 5, where he believed and he's clothed in God's righteousness. But James says, Verse 21, was not Abraham justified by works when he offered his own son upon the altar? That's what he said. This does not happen until Genesis 22. Abraham believed God, counted him as righteous. It's in Genesis 15. Right? Some 20 to 30 years later, this incident with Isaac walking up this hill is happening. Abraham was not saved by obeying God's command to sacrifice the son he had waited for so long. Please hang with me. But rather, he he was already counted as righteousness 20, 30 years before. All right? But rather, his works of obedience proved Because he took that boy on up the hill, built an altar, strapped him on it, put the wood underneath him. Thank God you had to kill him first before you set him on fire because that would have been bad. Drew, look, drew back the knife. You, you see no question here. You see no debate with God. You see nothing. Why? He already had faith in God. He, he got God's character. And God had already promised him some stuff, and so he believed God's promises, and he drew it back, man. 
I believe God's faithful to this and it. He'll provide something else. And he drew it back. God said, whoa! <laughs> Good thing. Drop the mic, the knife. <laughs> and in the thicket was a ram caught. And he said, sacrifice him instead. That's an Easter message. Watch this. Abraham's actions proved he had faith. Right? He, Abraham was not saved by faith plus works, but a faith that works. So how was Abraham justified by works when he had already been justified by faith? I'm glad you asked that question. That's going to be found in Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then? What, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Are you, are you guys listening? Okay, okay. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works... <laughs> I, love this. This is, I love the Bible. Now, to the one who works, his wages is not counted as a gift, but that's something you, you owe. In other words, if you work, you expect pay, don't you? If you don't, come see me. We might could use you. Um, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Did, 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 do you see how clear that was? By faith, he was justified before God, and his righteousness declared. By works, he was justified before men, and his righteousness demonstrated. In this case, his son, his, his, his son proved, and, and, God, and, and this angel's going to say something in, in a minute, and it's going to throw us off, and I'm going to explain this. When he sacrifices his son, the ram's caught, here, here it is. God says, he doesn't say this. Now you know I love you and have accepted you, Abraham, because I sent you a ram instead of your son. No, this is not what he says. He says, now I know you love me. Now I know you really have faith in me because you did not withhold your only son from me. Now, here's the question. Isn't God all-knowing? Then why did... If he already knew that Abraham was going to pass the test... Why ask him to do it? You, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Anybody ever thought that deep? Anybody? We got deep thinkers in here that go there and go. If you're going to, you know what I mean? If you're all knowing God, you already know what the outcome's going to be. You know, why create Adam and Eve? Why go there, women who just had babies and are like, that was painful because I got there too late and I didn't get to use that epidural I paid for. Right? Because of what Eve did, you have pain at childbirth and we got weeds in our garden and we got to work for our living and all that kind of stuff I mean, if God knows this beforehand why did he even ask it if God is all knowing right why didn't he know what Abraham's choice would be he did but you can't reward or hold a person responsible before they do something This wasn't about God, it's about Abraham. You understand? God already knew, but you can't, I can't give you a reward. Here's a piece of candy. I'm not giving you that one. That's a good one. I can't reward you or even hold you accountable or responsible for something that you have not done. So, God already knew he loved him. Right, but Abraham need to hear that. And so God said, I already know it's good, but in order for me to tell you that, in order for me to take you to the next leg of your journey, you got to do this because I want to reward you, and I want to do this, but I can't reward you on something you hadn't done. So go ahead and do it. Does that make sense? 
I'm over time. Our actions and works reveal our faiths on the inside. Now, Rahab. I'm a, I'm a, gosh, I got another page. Let's stand. I can't. We got 11 baptisms next service. I mean, we'll be back next week. We'll finish this and start into. That's the good thing about doing this. We'll just go right into something else. Is that good? Okay. You want, you want to hear about Rahab? Because she was a Gentile, she was not a Jew. You got the patriarch of patriarchs, Abraham. I can't relate to him. Son, I can relate to a Gentile down on the bottom of the barrel, no good for nothing prostitute. Not that I've ever prostituted for your information. <laughs> Some of you went there. Some of you went there. Trust me. They would pay me just to get out of there. You know what I mean? I want to tell you, you're going to have to hear why out of all these people that he could have chose, he chose Abraham and Rahab. We're going to relate to that. And it's powerful. It's powerful. Okay. Thank you, Lord, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is a gift from God. Right? Lord, but our faith and our salvation should produce, should produce, if we have an understanding of what you did, we truly get that. That we stood helpless, hopeless, nothing we could do. Nothing we could do. But by your grace, you offered us you offer a debt-free offer simply by putting our faith in what you did, right? You counted us righteous. With that understanding, we should not be like the churches that James is writing to, that a brother or sister that can't help themselves. There is a time to pray and there's a time to do. That in this time we would be doers, right? Not faithers. <laughs> we should produce outwardly what you have done inwardly. Hmm? You, 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 should see, you should see my walk with Jesus. You should see my understanding of Jesus. You should see my relationship with Jesus by my actions. Lord, we don't get Abraham, but we're going to get Rahab. And I'm so glad that you prompted the writer James to put both of these in here because we're going to find hope in the second one. But Lord, let our faith be in your power and your ability so much that, Lord, when the Holy Spirit prompts us to step out, it's something as simple as serve in the church or lead other people, that we would have enough confidence in your ability to work through us, right? That we'll step out and say, here am I. And watch what God can do with broken, hmm, fault-filled, but faith-filled people. Anybody in this house want to see Jesus work through you? Anybody in this house want to see heaven work through you. Anybody in this house want to see somebody come to the Lord because something, right, that was inside of you manifest outside of you and your faith, your faith, right, woke up. It was not dead anymore. It was alive and somebody saw that life that was on the inside of you outwardly and it changed them and it brought them to the foot of the cross where they found the same grace and mercy we did. Father, move us to the place. Right, Move us to the place that we would have faith in you and not of ourselves. We look at ourselves. We know ourselves. We know our inconsistencies. We know our inabilities. But through you, all things are possible. 
please let us have that kind of faith to step out and see you work in ways unimaginable to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody in the house say amen.